For most of my life, I've ridden, raced, and followed the technical evolution and development of Yamaha racing bikes. Well, the bug started in 1973 with my first race bike, which was a converted road bike into a replica TD1 race bike. I progressed on then to the next machine was actually a real pucker race bike, the TR2. That's when I really started to get interested in, in the machines. So then I thought, well, why not make a collection of every single production racer? So I started to do that. And then unfortunately, my garage wasn't big enough to house that many bikes. So what I decided was I wanted to collect one of every significant production change. And that's what I've ended up with. That's my collection. Why Yamaha? Because they're available was probably one of the big things. And then I continued on to stick with the Yamahas because not only were they available, but I found that there's a lot of interchangeability. What it meant you could do, you could take parts from one bike onto another. So it made that the collecting of bikes and especially keeping them running much, much easier because you could use parts from other, other machines, which allowed me to modify the bikes and get an older bike and, and what have you and continue on. It's a personal collection that ultimately um, I'm a custodian of some significant New Zealand bikes and some technology here that eventually will be sold to other people, hopefully like-minded, that, that just take an interest and just love the, the Yamaha story. Here we have 1969 TR2. 350 air cooled. This is Yamaha's really first 350cc production racer available to people. The significance of this machine is the adoption of the frame from the factory bikes and the large drum brakes on the front, four leading shoe and rear. Along with its 250cc brother, this really started to set the scene as a bike available to the average rider that would be very competitive. So my first racing career was really from 1973 to 78 um, when I came to a bit of a crossroad really. I had to either buy a new TZ uh, or get engaged. I chose to get engaged and that was the end of my first race career. Phillip Island, well, it's a fantastic place just to be able to ride on a world-class Grand Prix circuit. Hard on the side of the tyre accelerating and then turn three is just mind-blowing. Hard in fourth or fifth gear around there. Then. 20 years later, I caught the bug again. I was after every production racer that Yamaha made. So this next machine is a 1972 TR3 350. Yamaha also built this in a 250 version called the TD3. It was air-cooled still. Major changes here were the adoption of crankcases from road bikes, very much like the previous ones, but they were usable on a 250 or a 350. A few of the carryovers were also the, the big drum brake was, was there, but what was also significant was the move to electronic ignition. They had factory fitted electronic ignition. So, and a six-speed gearbox. So all of these things create more speed, more reliability. This also formed the platform of the next big significant change for Yamaha, which was going from air-cooled to water-cooled. The TR3, now that was, that was significant. It was the last of the 350 air-cooled, but it was also the foundation for what was to become the TZ. Yamaha water-cooled that, and then that started the whole line of water-cooled Yamahas. Previously, the air-cooled bikes they suffered from, especially in long races, the fact that the, the charge heated up and they lost power. They didn't actually have the durability, whereas water cooling maintains a constant temperature for the intake charge and the horsepower remained pretty stable. So that gave much more durable power delivery and for longer. So the next model change was in fact the low boy or the F model, which became my favorite bike and still is. Okay, so this is a 1979 TZ350F, the last of the 350s. The significant thing about this bike is an aluminium swinging arm and the continuation of monoshock. Previously, we had two shock absorbers at the back of the bike controlling the swing arm. 
Then Yamaha, once again coming from the motocross world, had a monoshock which connected the swing arm to the setup under the tank. This gave much greater range of movement and more controllability around the back end of the bike. So that was a major step forward. I was very fortunate to get a hold of a TZ750. And the really significant thing about that bike was it was the first four cylinder two stroke, but also it used reed valves. Okay, so what's a reed valve? It was actually adopted by Yamaha for the motocross fraternity where they wanted a bigger spread of power. What it does is it uses little valves inside here to stop the mixture going back out through the carburetor and it makes the engine less peaky. So in other words, you get a broader spread of power. Because this bike without it would have been very difficult to ride for the average person. Yamaha were very concerned about that. So that's why they adopted this reed valve technology to smoothen the power output. TZ750 is probably from a production racer point of view, it's got a great reputation. It's called the beast by some people because at the time, 90 or 100 horsepower was unheard of for a person to, the average person to have. To ride this bike, the first time I rode it, I was absolutely amazed how smooth it was. It was just, but it got faster and faster and became quite frightening. It was actually built for Daytona and it dominated Daytona. So much so, and the, what they had the Formula 750 class, that they, in, in the end, they, they almost banned the bike. And it, it, they killed the class because it, it was so successful. It's a real nostalgic motorcycle and one, one of the favourites of my collection. So this next bike is probably my pride and joy. It's a 1981 TZ500. It's the only one in New Zealand. Significant change here was the adoption of what they call power valves. YPVS, Yamaha power valve system. This was very similar to the reed valves. It allowed the power to be smoothly delivered at that lower revs. So that was used on the 250s and this machine actually uses similar cylinders. So the next machine I got that I, that I rode regularly was the TZ250N from 1985. This was Yamaha's last steel frame bike, but it was its first crankcase reed engine. Remember we saw reed valves go back into the back of the cylinder on the TZ750? On these ones, the reeds actually go into the crankcases, feeding the mixture directly into the crankcase. The advantage there was you now had more port area available through the cylinder. So there's a significant advantage or technology change here. You'll also notice how small these crankcases are. From the old F model, which had a lot of road-based stuff, they completely redesigned the engine to be much smaller. They actually made the crankshaft run backwards using a balance shaft and cross shaft to reduce the thrust loads and wear on the pistons. So once again, a big technology change around this model. Right from the very early time I started racing, it was just the the one-on-one, -on -one, it was it was you against the machine, but also it was, I was very mechanical and I liked to work on the machine. So it was it was the effort you put in to, to, to make the machine go or be reliable was, was as much as the riding. So that's really what kept me attracted to it and also build up the collection, was one, understand the technology, but also hands-on. And I really enjoy that. Now we've got a 1986 TZ250S. Significant change going on here. Aluminium beam frame. Big move there and also adopted from motocross, rising rate suspension. So no more monoshock sitting underneath the tank. This has a shock absorber sitting vertically. So technology once again transferring from motocross into the racing bikes. Same engine, crankcase reeds and all that. But now we start moving into the beam frame era. This is a 1989 TZ250W. The significance about this bike is it's got a rear exhaust system to get the efficiency out of the, the tuned exhaust. Plus also it has got fully adjustable rebound and, and compression damping on the forks, as well as a continuation of the suspension, which was fully adjustable. So now riders, not only could they tune the engine, they can play around with suspension, which was a new game in town. It wasn't just about horsepower, it was about how you set your bike up and this was fully tunable. 
I've ridden this bike, really, really nice to ride, but quite a revelation from the previous bikes because of the movement of the weight forward, steeper steering angle, you're actually sitting right over the front of this bike, quite different to ride from, from the earlier ones, but incredibly stable and a really nice bike to ride. Finally, we got a 1991 TZ250B. Now we're gone, the numbering's gone back again. The significance of this bike, it's a V-twin whereas previously they'd all been parallel twins, so they retained the um, delta box suspension, rising rate. The other significant change or technical change on this bike was upside down forks. This is the first of the TZ production races that are upside down forks, once again, fully tunable. So this is the, really the last big technological change for the TZ250 race today. Built this for some years later, but they really didn't change the technology much. They just improved on, on engine management because this bike here, they had crankcase reeds, but they also had power valves, but everything was electronically controlled now. So that's where the improvements came in the electronic control of the engine as opposed to previously it was mechanical changes. This here is, I guess, the culmination of a long lifeline of TZ race, production race bikes. I guess, is there anyone else crazy enough to have this many Yamahas? You've seen nine here, I've actually got 22 odd and I've got about 25 race bikes and 50 motorbikes in total. I've got two lovely daughters, but I've got 20 sons. That's how I feel about these bikes.